He that hath this hope in himself purifies himself, even as he is impure. All right, amen. Turn to the book of Genesis, chapter number 49 tonight, please, verse 24. Genesis. Genesis chapter number 49 and verse number 24. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. But his bow abode in strength. The arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Lord, anoint me to preach tonight. Bless your holy word as it goes forth. In thy name I pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Jacob became a prophet, folks. Quite a prophet. The usurper. And we've read his life. It's quite a thing. And now we come down to the end of his life. And he gathers all of his children around him. And he begins to pronounce his blessings and uh, future for them. And here we have him saying in verse number 24, Joseph is a fruitful bough. Well, he'd already been fruitful because had it not been for Joseph, Israel would never have survived because God put him in Egypt to make a way for them to be fed. Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. But here I want you to notice the scripture says, but his bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. And who is the God of Jacob? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. His name is Jehovah. yod heh vau heh The Tetragrammaton. Jehovah. And so we have here in Genesis chapter number 49, he said, From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Now who is this? When it's talking about the shepherd coming, who is the stone of Israel. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ is the shepherd, no question about it. And But he is also the stone of Israel. So what we have here is a double application to one person separated by 2,000 years of time. For when he came the first time, he came as a shepherd. A shepherd, a lowly shepherd. But when he comes the second time, he'll come as a stone cut out of a mountain to smite the image on its feet. So the Bible introduces a stone, a rock, as it represents the God of Jacob. Deuteronomy 32 verse 15 says, They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. May we introduce here the queen of heaven. May we talk about Marduk. May we talk about Milcom. May we talk about the gods of the heathen, the gods of the pagan. Uh, should we talk about the valley of Hinnom where they offered up their little children as burnt sacrifices unto this God? Can, can we talk about tonight those who turned against the truth and turned to fables? There are those who say, Lord, bless America. No, God's already blessed it. America, thank God. That's what you need to be praying tonight. Because when America begins to thank God, then you're going to see a difference in this country. It's already been blessed, blessed beyond what it deserves. So the mighty God of Jacob. So the Bible said in chapter number 32 of the book of Deuteronomy, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger. Now, why is this so important? It's important because God chose one people he chose the Jewish people to, to, to manifest himself, to reveal himself to, and therefore they had the truth of the living God and by also the writing of Scripture. God said, Moses, write a book. So we do not look to Gentiles for revelation. We look to the Jew for revelation. Paul said in Romans that unto them was committed the oracles of God. They would go to the oracle of uh, to the oracles that they had in those days, Delphi, and they'd go to these oracles and ask the future. Kings would go and and try to find out what was going to happen, maybe in a battle or to their kingdom. They had their oracles. They've got their wisdom. They've got their knowledge. They've got their understanding, and it's all based upon fellowship with demons. Keep that in mind. With demons, the Bible said they sacrificed unto devils, not to God. To gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, 
and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Did you know this is a big difference between a rock and dirt? Don't you think? There's a huge difference between rock and dirt. Think about that for a moment tonight. Think about the fact that when God spoke into existence, everything that you see, he brought it forth from his word. But did you know that when he made the man and put life in him, he gave him his very breath. And that made man different from everything else on the face of this earth. As I said to you the other day, we read nowhere in the Bible where it says angels breathe. We read nowhere in the Bible where angels even have the capacity to love, but man does. We read nowhere in the Bible where an angel has a capacity to repent, but a man does. You can repent. We read nowhere in the Bible where it says an angel can have fellowship with God, but a man can. You can walk with him in the cool of the day. You're different, folks. You are as far above an animal as God is above you. Let that settle in tonight. Because we live in a generation that kills their babies and kisses their dogs. Amen. 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 Second Samuel chapter 22 verse 32 said, For who is God? Save Jehovah, save the Lord. And who is a rock? Save our God. This rock is a permanent foundation. This is a marker. This is something that separates uh, Israel from the rest of them. In the Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 31 it says, For their rock is not as our rock. Even our enemies themselves being judges. For, here's what that means. That means that even, the, even when, when Israel comes up against an enemy, the other enemy is watching and they see that the God of Israel is superior to the God of the pagans that they're fighting. For the Bible said in Deuteronomy 32, their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asp. So even though they are worshiping their gods, they're killing themselves because the worship of their God is nothing but the worship of death, though they think it is the giving of life. So the Bible says in Deuteronomy 32, he is the rock, his work, his work is perfect, all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. The Lord said you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Neither cometh they to the truth, which is the light, they don't want to come to it. Why don't they come tonight and hear the word of God? What? But I'll tell you, there's one thing we don't know for certain. It goes out electronically. And it's being streamed all over the world. And I've gotten emails this past week from, uh, from South Africa. I've gotten them from Europe. We get them from all over the world. They're watching this. And thanks be unto God for it. Remember not too long ago, I got an email from a Romanian church in West Australia. Now put that together. A Romanian church, and they were sweet people. Sweet, I logged on and watched their worship services. Good people, love the Lord. Romanian Christians in the western part of Australia. This is a small world in some ways. Kind of blows your mind. His work is perfect for all of his ways. Our judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. You'll never get justice from the world, folks. You hear them say, oh, nobody's above the law. Above the what law? Are you talking about your convenient law for the season? The laws come and the laws go. You change them and manipulate them at will. But they expect you to live under their iron rule and under their hand. The Bible says over here, it's quite a remarkable thing when you read it. It says in Psalm 94, verse 22, The God of my rock and him will I trust. He's my shield, the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my savior. Thou savest me from violence. I will call on the Lord who's worthy to be praised. He can save you in every way possible. He saves your life. He saves your mind. He saves you from your enemies. He saves you from yourself. He's able to save to the uttermost all that come unto God by him. In Psalm chapter number 62, verse 7, God is my salvation, my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. Psalm 28, 1 says, And to thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock, be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down to the pit. In plain words, to communicate with God is to communicate with life. Have you prayed today? Have you read your Bible this past week? Will you read your Bible this upcoming week? Will you pray? God saw to it that he gave you a book that's on a sixth or a seventh grade reading level. Yeah. Amen. You ought to read Shakespeare sometime. 
and lay it down next to a King James Bible, you'll understand what I'm talking about. It's easy to understand in that sense. So he says over here in Psalm 28, I will cry, O Lord, but do not be silent. I will be like them that go into the pit. Now this is one of the most beautiful scriptures in the Bible coming up. Isaiah 26 and verse 4. This is beautiful. Trust ye in the Lord. Trust ye in Jehovah forever. For in the Lord Jehovah, this is one of the few places in the Old Testament that the Tetragrammaton is translated as Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah. So we have, trust ye in the Lord, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Now that's a beautiful thing. Because if you look at the Hebrew, strength, you'll find out that that word means rock. And so it is everlasting. You mean it's a rock of ages. That's exactly right. Yeah. The song Rock of Ages comes directly from this passage. And here's what it says. Rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Yes. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. These are good words, folks. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, when mine eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. They say that's one of the most uh, uh, loved songs in the Christian world is rock of ages. You'll get your book now and you look at it in this, in this hymnal and you'll see that what I read to you tonight is more than what you've got in that hymnal. There's a little bit of difference. So I got on the internet and, I, inter internet and I started checking. I thought, well, no, this may be one. No, it's not. It's everywhere you find it. What I just read to you tonight is the rock of ages, the song, all the lyrics that apply to it. Isn't that a beautiful thing? The rock of ages, the Lord Jehovah, he's everlasting strength. The Bible said in Psalm chapter number 94, verse 22, the God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield, the horn of my salvation. Now turn to Isaiah chapter number 8 and verse number 14 with me tonight. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 14. We'll start reading with verse 16. I want you to look at this with me. Isaiah chapter number 8 verse 16. Therefore, thus, Isaiah 28 16 rather. Isaiah 28 16. And therefore, tw therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion... For a foundation, a stone. Now let's stop for just a moment. The word Zion is a Hebrew word which means strength, fortress, fortitude, a foundation. So he said, it's a play on words. I lay in the foundation, a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. The Lord Jesus quotes this in Matthew 21, verse number 42. And here's what he says. Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Why would it be? Why would he say that because they rejected the stone that it is marvelous in the eyes of God? Look carefully. Verse 43. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, you Israel, you Jews. It will be taken from you, given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof, to the Gentiles, to us. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. There's the two comings again. If you fall on that stone, you're broken. Thank God I've done that already. <laughs> Amen. And probably there's more of me that needs to be broken. But I thank God tonight that I have fallen on that stone. 
and I have been broken. But it says, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Remember what he said in Daniel, the stone that is cut out of the mountain smites the image on its feet. All right. Well, the mountain represents a kingdom. The image was in 606 BC, the image in the plains of Dur to Nebuchadnezzar. It represents the Gentile kingdoms all the way up to the present time. So how do they end, preacher? How do all these Gentile kingdoms come to an end? A stone. The stone. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. So what do you mean by that? The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back. And he's going to put the kingdoms of the world in a trash heap where they belong. But look carefully at again with what he's saying. Now, Peter quotes this, and then I'll come back to it. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. Here's what he says, quoting the same scripture. Therefore, it's very important. To whom coming as into a living stone, disallowed indeed of man, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also, listen, look at this now, it is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion, Sion, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Now that cornerstone could be one of two things or could be two things. It could be the very corner that the building is built from. It's the beginning of the foundation. If it's not right, none of the rest of the foundation will be right. It's important for that cornerstone to be exactly where it's supposed to be. Laid by the hand of the master builder. When the temple of God was built, that stone was fashioned far away. You couldn't even hear the hammer. You couldn't hear the chisel. You couldn't hear anything. The master builder knew exactly what he needed, where it was going to go, and how big it was going to be. And when they brought it and laid it down, it fit perfectly. You have been cut from that place. You've been cut from a quarry. And before you were ever brought and put in that wall, he fashioned you, cut you. He had a purpose for you. He knew exactly where you were going to go. Ha! They didn't hear the sound of a chisel, not the sound of a hammer, nothing. And yet when he came with that stone, the master builder said, oh, yes, I've been waiting for that one. It goes right here. And he puts you in the wall. That's what he did with me. I didn't come through man. The master builder did that. So the chief cornerstone is the first stone that goes down. And the building is built around it as it relates to it. It is the, it is the, it is the mark of the foundation. But then it can also be this. It can also be the headstone. It can be the final stone. It can be the capstone. And my friends, so therefore you have what is between the capstone and the foundation stone, which makes up what these, pre these, these, these apostles are quoting. So what do you mean, preacher? I'm telling you that Israel goes in between the foundation and the capstone. They've got their place in there. But so do we. Amen. So do we. You see, for Israel, it is a kingdom. For us, it's the king and the church of the living God. This stone represents a spiritual kingdom and a physical kingdom. And when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, he comes back and he will place that final stone on top of that building. And my dear friend, I'm in there. Thanks be unto God tonight. Been in there now since 1973. Nobody can take me out. The fact of the matter is, they don't even know where I am because I'm hidden with Christ. I've got wood covering me up. <laughs> I got wood covering me up. But he didn't stop at that when he walked into that temple. It's not the wood that he sees. It's not the stone that he sees. He sees gold that covers that wall. The gold represents the, the deity of Christ. The wood represents his humanity. And the stone is me that is cut out. And so when this image is smitten on its feet by this stone that's cut out of a mountain. The image comes crumbling down. The Gentile kingdoms are finished and done for. But oh, my friend, when we go into the millennium, those that go into the millennium that are part of that kingdom will be these born again believers that you are tonight. And it'll be the Jews. It'll be the Jews. Make no mistake about it. So he's gotten both. This is why he says, this is marvelous in our eyes. How would the casting away of Israel be marvelous? No, they've been put away temporarily. And then they're going to be brought right back in. 
That's marvelous in his eyes. This is why Peter says this. You're a lively stone. You're a spiritual house. You're a holy priesthood. You're all for spiritual sacrifices, acceptable God. But it is contained in the scripture. I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. He'll not be, he'll not be, he'll not be confused. He, he'll not be without purpose, without a life, without, without a vision, without, without a way to live, without how, what life is about. I learned a little about life in 1973 when I got saved. I thought, I thought I knew a lot about life when I got saved and know anything. I began to learn what life was about. Yeah. Wasn't about the flesh, it's about spirit. But the reason I didn't know anything about the spirits is because I wasn't spiritual. I was dead in my sins, dead in trespasses and sins. Amen. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. I was a natural man. I was carnal man. I was everything but Christ. Every single thing but him. And I want you to notice what he says in Daniel chapter number 2 verse 34. Thou sawest till that stone was cut out without hands which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor and the wind carried them away and there was no place found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great kingdom, mountain kingdom and filled the whole earth. This is the dream and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. So Nebuchadnezzar started listening because Daniel told him exactly what he had dreamed. Daniel, folks, in the Bible is one of three men that are set aside for their righteousness. Daniel, Job, and Noah. That's right, not David, not Abraham, but Daniel, Job, and Noah. These three men, and you read about them in the book of Ezekiel. Read what Ezekiel says. Just do a little... Just if you've got a computer, just type Daniel, Job, or Noah in there, and you'll pull them up and see what it says about them. It says that their own righteousness would save them, but it wouldn't save anybody else. Nobody else. Daniel, folks, let me tell you again, I don't know if it did Wednesday night or not. Daniel in that Bible stands head and shoulders above everything else in there of humanity, save Abraham and David and a couple of more. Daniel, my dear friend, is one of the greatest heroes that ever walked the face of this earth. Daniel's book of prophecy is one of the greatest books of prophecy in all the Bible. The Lord Jesus Christ, as you shall see, as Daniel the prophet said, talking to Israel, talking, to the restora talking about the restoration of Israel, he called him a prophet. And the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. As it was in the days of Noah, then it was as it was in the days of who? Lot, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Well, Noah had to do with angels coming in, sons of God coming in, cohabiting with women, and giants, the Nephilim, were born in those days because of this in Genesis 6. But what about Lot? What's Lot got to do with anything? I mean, how does that relate to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? What was Lot's problem? Where did Lot live? Yeah, where did he live? He, where did he sit in the gate? Where did, he chose to, where did he choose to cast his tent toward? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Sodom. That's where he did. So what we have then, therefore, before the stone that's cut out of a mountain smites the image on its feet, we have an intervention from heaven. We have a spirit being, sons of God, coming down to the earth, entering in into this with this with this mix in miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And we also have the rise of sodomy. And man, I'm telling you right now, you're living in it. Yes. Somebody said, preacher, America is headed for destruction. No, it's dying night tonight. It's not headed anywhere. It's already there. They've already reached that point. And you know, there's always a point of no return. And I wonder, have they come to the point of no return? My, 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 my. I feel sorry for people to have little children and they're bringing them into this world and they're raising them. I feel sorry for you, brother. Those are two beautiful little boys you've got right there. Yes, they are. I'm sure you love them with all your heart. They have no concept of the world that they've been born into. 
no concept whatsoever. And may God protect them. May God bless them, the little ones. And then may he come and get them soon. That's our only hope is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said in Matthew chapter number 21, verse 44, Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. You see, when the Lord comes back on a white horse, he shows no mercy. There's no grace. Tonight, the age of grace is in full bloom. The door is swung open wide. We have a way and an access to the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. That big veil was split asunder from the top to the bottom. We have a, now we have, a, we have a new and living way to come to God through our Lord Jesus. It's been that way now for 2,000 years, and people have taken it for granted and gone to sleep with it. They sleep about it anymore. They've heard it so many times. But folks, you wait till that door shut. You wait till it's shut. According to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, he that letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. Then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume. There's a man in here this morning from western, North Carol uh, western New York and he's moved down to Madisonville. And I talked to him over here. He had his family with him. And he came from western part of New York State. He said, Preacher, he said, you go to the door down there, where, up there where I used to live. And he said, you knock on their door and they come to the door and, and talk to you and you tell them, I want to talk to you about the Lord. They'll look at you in the face and say, shut up, get out of here, I don't want to hear any of it. Just like that. Just as cold and dead and final as it can be. So he said, we moved down to Madisonville. We're in Tennessee now. He said, Preacher, the people are so different down here. I said, yeah, they're different, all right. <laughs> they're different. He said, but you know what? It took me a little while to begin to understand what that difference really was. I said, what's that? He said, well, everybody's saved down here. <laughs> everybody's saved down here in the South. Everybody. Nobody lost. They're all saved. <laughs> he said, I'm afraid that the uh, cultural salvation down here it's not working too good. No, it's not. No, it's not. Uh, everybody's not saved. And I know one that wasn't. In 1973, he did get saved. But you see, that's our, huh, that's our thorn in the flesh. Up there, it's cold, dead rejection. But down here, it's institutionalized religion. Cultural salvation. Cultural and the problem with all of that is that so many people are so deceived by it that they think they are Christian. They do. They think they're Christian. You've heard it called, called the Bible Belt, haven't you? Surely. Somebody called it the Bible Belt one time. You know, <coughs> the place where the Word of God is preached, taught, and loved and respected. But it's not the same world that I was born into. It's all changed. It's all changed. It's not the same. You know, our only hope tonight, even so come, Lord Jesus. We got the midterm elections coming up. I hope something happens to be good, but I'm not putting my faith in politics. I won't knowingly vote for a devil, no. I'll do my part as long as I can as, as a citizen of the United States, certainly. But folks, I really don't put my hope in them. I've seen, they failed us too many times. They've lied to us, both sides, both sides. They've lied to us. I'm getting to where I don't trust any of them. Amen. I don't trust them. My faith is in the Lord Jesus tonight. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Yeah. Father, bless your word, time we've had together. I thank you for it. And I thank you for what you've done for us today at Temple. And Father, your word is not a temporary thing. It takes root and it lives forever. It goes forth for the purpose you intended. You sow it, you plant it, and you water it. And Father, I pray for those that heard it tonight. Maybe they'll examine themselves. Maybe they'll realize what I said is true. Maybe they'll understand that they've been a Christian all their life, but they really don't know what they don't know Christ. It's just been a cultural thing with them. They've been told they were a Christian, but they don't know him. I pray for them. I pray for them. In Jesus' name, 
Amen.